So LinkedIn data ecosystem, right? So uh, if you look at here, right, LinkedIn has a vision, right? Create the economic opportunity for every member on the global uh, workforce. What do you mean by that, right? If you look at the boxes here, so there are close to 500, um, maybe more, uh, over 500 million members we have in our uh, network and we have close to uh, millions of uh, companies, jobs and skills we have. With that, we have created an economic graph, right? And that economic graph will help us uh, deriving our mission. That mission is uh, how all the members on the global workforce in the professional world can connect each other and they can be successful and productive enough. So this is the mission and vision we are carrying and, and working towards that to achieve that, right? And to have that kind of uh, member uh, force and all those things, and just want to talk about the scale we are working in, in LinkedIn. So if you look at the, uh, there are two things, one is Kafka and uh, that is on the online side and the Hadoop, which is offline batch processing side, right? For Kafka uh, is a stream processing uh, platform where it is connected to the online world and, and if you look at the messages per day, we are getting around close to more than two trillion messages per day, right? And if you look at, uh, Incoming data, it's a 0.5 petabyte per day compressed format, and the out data is 2.3 petabytes. It's a more than 2.3 petabytes out. And uh, if you look at the speed, right, 15 million messages per second in the peak time. And uh, in terms of Hadoop, right, so if you see, we have around more than 400,000 users. Users, I meant that those are uh, business users or relevance users or the developers like us, right? We use Hadoop on daily basis. So that is a scale we have. And the data we ingested close to more than, uh, or more than 100 terabytes of data per day we ingest. And the total HDFS size we have more than 100 petabytes, right? And uh, in terms of number of jobs, what we are running right now is close to 2,000 jobs across all the clusters that we have, that with the cluster size we have more than 10 clusters and each one is close to 9,000 nodes, right? So this is the scale we have uh, in LinkedIn. To achieve this scale and to process this kind of data, this much of data, right? We need a bigger infrastructure and the scalable and the efficient infrastructure, right? So if you look at this one, right? We have a, a, a flow of uh, platforms and where these kind of data will get processed each and every day. So if you look at the left side of that one, that the data sources we have, uh, Oracle DB, where we have all the uh, dimension related information, then Espresso for NoSQL store, and the Voldemort, Kafka that we have already talked about, and there are multiple third party services we are using. So the data we generate with these systems and what we do, right, it, it comes to Goblin. Goblin is the ingestion platform you might have heard about that. It's already open source community, right? So what Goblin does, it gets the data from these systems and that's pushed on the HDFS storage layer. So we call it data storage layer that is HDFS and the scale we talked about just a previous slide, right? And after the we store this data, what we do, right? We have access layer, we call it DALI, and it's a beautiful abstraction layer on top of HDFS. And what it provides us, right? So it provides us the abstraction on top of the data what we have. So users don't need to worry about the format of the data. So let's say today we you have Avro format, tomorrow you wanted to go for per uh, or, or, or ORC. You don't need to, our user don't need to worry about what kind of data you have underlined. They can access through DALI without changing anything. So after this data access layer, we have a data processing framework, right? There are multiple. So we are using Pig, Hive, MapReduce, and currently we are migrating towards Spark and Presto, right? So these are the data processing framework we are using to process this kind of data every day. And how to process this data and, and schedule, we have Askaven that is a workflow scheduler that we are using. So in, the, in Askaven you can schedule, uh, you, can, you can build your workflow, it's a DAG, where you can set up your jobs on the regular uh, cadence, right? And uh, this Askaven scheduler can be used for developers, users, business users, and anybody can use that in our uh, ecosystem. It's already, I think, it's in the open source community, right? After this, right, when data is processed, data is transformed, we push data, and uh, how, who all the users, right? Left-hand side, if you look at, right, analytics use case. So we have reporting, uh, which 
uh, tools which uses this data to derive the insight, analytics users who do the daily, accept the data, come up with a good insight of top of data, and the relevance who does the data science work, machine learning, and all, the, all those things, right? And we have done, we have built some tools on top of that for the reporting purpose, XLNT, Raptor, and Third Eye. XLNT is an A-B testing tool, so it, it used for that. Reporter, uh, Raptor is a, is a visualization tool where you can uh, do slash and dice the data and see the reports on, on, on Raptor, uh, Raptor. Third eye is an anomaly detection. If something goes wrong, how to trigger the notification and all those things, right? So this is the complete uh, uh, infrastructure that we are using. Uh, in LinkedIn, and there are some more. I did not mention that, but this is the pretty much uh, the way we are doing that, right? So when you have a big infrastructure, right, and so much of data, there would be a chances of, uh, there would be so much of challenges, right? How to overcome those challenges and all. It's scalability problems and efficiency problems and all those things, right? So if you look at, right, first one is scale up the system. So if you have this much of data and, and this big system, how you can scale up? So there are uh, tons of, uh, tens of uh, hundreds of nodes we have and the petabytes of data. So how we are scaling it up, right? So what we have done here in LinkedIn is a federated SDFS, we are using this concept. So what we have done that we are using name node and in a horizontal scaling, right? So we don't have single point of failure, we are using in a multiple clusters. So what we have done right now, we have, uh, what, we have what Hadoop job generates logs, right? We have separated logs with the data so that we can scale horizontally uh, with this one. And the DALI, what we have talked about is the access layer. You can, you can access the data without having any, any, any change in the data or data format, right? The second challenge is the scaling up the cluster. So you have, in this setup, you have so many users daily, uh, running daily jobs and so many jobs or hundreds of jobs running in a day in, on the daily basis, right? How, 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 how can you uh, manage that one? So let's say you have a job and that's a big job and you have run that and that is taking so much of resources. Other guys are impacting because of your resource, right? So how, how can you uh, handle this kind of scenario, this, this kind of problems, right? So what we have done, we have created the org queues, Hadoop org queues. So this is the concept, what we have done that based on the org, based on the department, we created the queues. So for the department, it's like a mini cluster for them. They can run their job with that queue, right? So you don't need to uh, worry about the resources for others, uh, other queues. You, you can use that resources to run, their, run your job. But in the R queue, what we have done that it's a dynamically, right? If you don't use that, other guys, uh, other guys can use your, your resources. So it's a, uh, you, you are not blocking your resources if you are not using them, right? And the third challenge is uh, scaling up the computation. So if you, if you have a big system, so many jobs are running, Right, so you need, you still need the resources to run jobs, right? So that is how this Dr. Elephant come into the picture. What it does, right, you need to, it suggests to you the things that you can tune your jobs accordingly so that you can, your jobs can run efficiently with the lesser number of resources and all, right? And still we are coming up with the better other uh, strategies to handle this kind of, uh, uh, to overcome this problem of the computation related, right? So this is how we are doing this in LinkedIn. And Dr. Elephant, earlier it was MR, now we are coming up with that, what he's talk, going to talk about the Spark jobs as well. So these are the open source projects that we have. There, we have multiple others, but we have listed down, which is already very much famous in outside community. Kafka, uh, Goblin, Dr. Elephant, Pino for the all app store, online uh, real time and the SAMSA for uh, real-time computation framework, right? Similar to Storm outside. Azkaban, it's a workflow scheduler, and the uh, Photon ML, it's from the machine learning uh, side. People are doing so much of TensorFlow deep learning, so they have built this framework, and they, then open source also. And there are some other work is going on, then I think it will come again sometime soon, right? So, thank you, this is, the talk about the LinkedIn ecosystem that what infrastructure and what challenges we are having uh, on that one. Thank you. So, yeah. So, uh, next talk would be Akshay on uh, Dr. Elephant, Spark Heuristics, and he'd be talking about that. And then just after that, we'll have a QA on.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Akshay. I work here at LinkedIn in the data platform team. And uh, today I'm going to talk about how to tune your Spark jobs using Dr. Elephant. So Dr. Elephant is a popular service here at LinkedIn uh, that essentially identifies poorly tuned jobs on our cluster and gives recommendations on how to tune them. So here's an agenda of what I'll be covering today. I'll talk about the growth of Hadoop at LinkedIn. Um, why do you need to tune your jobs? How hard it is to tune them? What is Dr. Elephant, what it does? And then for the most part, I'll be talking about Spark support in Dr. Elephant, what challenges we faced while uh, adding Dr. Uh, Spark into Dr. Elephant, followed by some of the Spark rules and heuristics and the future roadmap for Dr. Elephant. So back in the year 2008 was when LinkedIn set up its first production Hadoop cluster. So we started out with a small cluster of 20 nodes, uh, five to 10 active developers wrote a bunch of workflows in uh, typical MapReduce uh, code. Uh, but the success of running workflows like people you may know on such small clusters inherently made us to keep scaling these clusters. So we kept on throwing machines uh, and fast forwarding to today, we have like more than 10 clusters. Each cluster has thousands of nodes. Uh, we support multiple different frameworks, uh, thousands of uh, users actively using this uh, framework. And we have hundreds and thousands of workflows that we run in production. So recently, as we have been inching towards Spark, we have been running more and more diverse and huge Spark applications on our cluster. Uh, so at this scale, you know that Spark requires high memory nodes, so you can't keep throwing machines to the problem forever. And at some point, you need to start tuning the resources that you already have. And how do you tune? Two ways. One is you tune the cluster, uh, which you can do successfully using a lot of uh, available tools out there. The second most important is tuning the jobs themselves that run on the cluster. So a lot of resources can be saved by tuning the jobs that the developers run. However, we first need to understand that tuning a job is not an easy task. Uh, we have too many different frameworks to run our jobs. We have uh, too many different settings in each of these frameworks. These parameters are interrelated. We have overwhelming amount of data and the data is completely scattered. So for a developer to tune a job is, is difficult, it's time consuming and makes him underproductive. And this, so you basically uh, need to have a balance between your developer's productivity and your cluster's efficiency. You want to have a completely efficient cluster for which you need all the jobs to be tuned, but you do not want to burden the users. Uh, we faced these problems in the early days of Hadoop at LinkedIn and we tried several different approaches to address this problem. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about that. So we first started training our users. We started training and educating them on how to tune their jobs. Uh, however, this did not scale because uh, soon when there were more and more Hadoop people joining LinkedIn, uh, more and uh, more people using our infrastructure. And these people coming to Hadoop were from different Hadoop background. Uh, on top of it, there were newer frameworks coming every six months. So we couldn't keep having this uh, varied uh, training sessions for all of these people uh, and uh, the, the growth of people were increasing and so we couldn't keep doing this forever. The, the larger problem there was that there was no incentive for the developers to tune and there was no way for us to verify if the job is tuned. So the next thing we did was we set up a expert panel who would review workflows on behalf of the users. Uh, so they would review the workflows, give them suggestions, and upon their discretion, their approval, their workflows can go into production and they can run it in production. Uh, so this ensures that every job is now tuned and every job is tuned by an expert. This again has the problem of scalability. The experts are limited in number. Uh, we want daily more and more workflows to go into production. And this process is again slow because the developers need to set up an appointment with the expert. The expert gives suggestions, they go back, fix it and then set up another appointment and so on. So this used to take sometimes several months for a workflow to go into production this way. And moreover, uh, this is a manual review process. So this is prone to human errors. Two different experts reviewing the same workflow might have uh, contradicting views on certain matters. But however, during this review process, we came across several common patterns like over allocation of resources, straggler tasks, skewness in the jobs. And we decided why not we automate this? And that basically made us to build a service that will scan all the jobs that run on our cluster looking for this existence of these patterns. So that basically led to Dr. Elephant. Uh, we 
we translate these patterns into rules and feed it into plug it into Doctor Elephant, and now Doctor Elephant will uh, go through all the jobs and search for these patterns. And then, if there is an issue, it gives you advice on how to fix it. It recommends best practices. You can track the historical executions of your job, how it performed. You can look at important metrics uh, and uh, much more. So now this expert review process, uh, which was manual, was now automated through Dr. Elephant. So we set up a Jira, automated Jira client that talks to Dr. Elephant and automatically goes and comments on the Jira ticket saying uh, it's good or bad. And so we uh, automated our roughly about 80% of our workflows directly going to production through this process uh, without any intervention from the experts. So this is how Dr. Elephant looks like. Uh, this is this this is the home page of Dr. Elephant. You go there, you see a bunch of workflows. Uh, you see metrics for each workflow, which says how many GBRs of resources this flow has consumed, uh, how much percentage of resources was waste, what's the total runtime, and how much time it spent uh, was was the delay out of that overall runtime. And uh, uh, in addition, you see how many jobs inside those flows were critical, how many jobs were moderate. And upon clicking that individual flow, you see all the jobs within that flow. You can again see metrics at a job level. Now you can get uh, important links to your scheduler, your resource manager, job history server. And then uh, you, you can see how many jobs, how many MapReduce applications or how many Spark applications within that job were critical. And upon clicking each MapReduce application, you get a report of that specific Spark job application or the MapReduce application. So at the bottom, you see all the heuristics, uh, the Spark configuration, Spark executor metrics. They are all the written in the boxes. They are all rules or heuristics, what we call them at LinkedIn. Uh, and the color basically represents how severe that uh, rule is. So red indicates it's critical, green indicates it's safe, and then there's a range of values between them. This is uh, this is you can you can look at the historical executions of your job. You can see, yeah. So GBRs is basically the resource usage of a job. So it's how much container is blocked for this duration. So the unit is GB into hours. Uh, that's how we compute the resource usage of an application. Yes, if the job, if there's one GB of container allocated and runs for one hour, it's uh, one GBR. So this is the uh, historical, you can look at the historical executions of your job, uh, see how uh, the, the job's performance in terms of rules and heuristics. You can look at uh, all the important settings that were used in each of these executions. You can see by changing certain uh, parameters, how the performance or how the rule changed from red to green and so on. Upon clicking a critical rule, you get suggestions on how you can fix them. And uh, so now that we know what Dr. Elephant is, let's look at how it works behind the scenes. So this is a high level diagram of Dr. Elephant. So starting from the left, if you see, uh, that's the application fetcher module, which basically periodically fetches the fresh set of YARN applications from the resource manager. And once we have all the applications, we have a metrics fetcher module that fetches and collects as much as metrics possible for that application. So ideally it talks to the history server and then collects all the uh, metrics for the applications. And then once we have all the data, we run a bunch of rules on these metrics. And uh, the analyzed results are then stored in a MySQL database. And then there's a UI where uh, the users go and look for the report. Uh, we support Yarn, Yarn at this, we'll run Yarn at LinkedIn, so all Yarn applications are supported. So we haven't looked into setting this up on such an environment, uh, but in the open source, there were lots of discussions that were happening, and I'm not sure if uh, anyone succeeded in doing that, or, uh, yeah, we, we were, uh, like, it's, it wasn't our priority to do it. Uh, So can we uh, take the questions at the end? Yeah, we'll have a session for that. 
So now uh, I'll focus on the Spark part in Dr. Elephant. Uh, so what do you need to do to enable Spark job analysis? So coming back to that diagram, we had the application fetcher, which will now fetch all the Spark YAN applications. And now we need a Spark metrics fetcher module that fetches metrics for the Spark applications. So we talked to the Spark history server to get all of the metrics. So we built this module. Uh, we talked to the Spark REST uh, history server over REST to get all of the metrics. And then we have a bunch of Spark rules that run on them. Uh, however, while testing this module, uh, we found that when Dr. Elephant was making too many REST calls uh, to the Spark history server, the, uh, the requests were timing out and the history server would eventually hang and crash. Uh, and a related issue you might notice is that at peak loads, you might have seen that your report is not available in Spark history server. Uh, the, the problem here basically is with the caching mechanism in the Spark history server. Uh, when we, the cache is limited in size and when Dr. Elephant fetches all these applications and now makes rest calls for all of these applications to Spark history server, uh, the Spark history server needs to replay the logs, load it into the cache and then serve it. So if the application is not in the cache, it needs to replay and replay is a slow process and then the request timeout on the Dr. Elephant side. Uh, if the requests are already there, uh, if the jobs are already replayed, then it, re uh, it returns from the cache. Uh, and when we make too many calls to, on the Spark history server side, so when you make too many calls, uh, there are too many cache evicts need, that need to happen because the there's too many applications, the cache is limited in size, and that basically triggers the GC process and that slows down the Spark history, history server. So what do we do? Uh, we we tried two approaches. One is not to use the REST endpoint to try and fix the solution immediately. So uh, we tried to write a log parser. So we replayed the logs that is there in HDFS to get the metrics. And the other one is to fix the Spark history server itself. So I'll go into a little bit of details in uh, both these areas. So with the event log parsing, what we basically wanted to do is replay the logs that is there in HDFS to collect the metrics. But the problem here was that these Spark applications create huge, large log files. And uh, for Dr. Elephant to replay it, you need to load the logs into its memory. So you either have to give more memory into Dr. Elephant, uh, or on the, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, the other problem is that Dr. Elephant has some threads that analyze these jobs. So we do not want these threads to get blocked analyzing large pass Spark applications while other Spark applications were waiting for them to get analyzed. So we had to put a cap on how large log files Dr. Elephant can analyze. So the problem basically was that it couldn't analyze all the Spark jobs now. Uh, the other issue here is that we can't get all the metrics from by replaying the logs because there's a lot of aggregation logic in Spark that is not exposed outside. So the other solution is to fix the Spark history server. Uh, there's an upstream ticket in Spark. It's an umbrella ticket that addresses all of the Spark history server problems. And uh, what we did is basically we took all of those patches, we deployed it internally at LinkedIn. We had to add a couple of patches uh, to which were basically adding some more metrics which we wanted. And uh, this basically addresses the caching problem through level DB and some improved caching. Uh, and we found that this history server was more stable and Dr. Lippin was, was able to make rest calls now and get back the responses. So now let's look at the Spark rules uh, that's there in Dr. Elephant. Uh, before that, let's just recall the layout of the Spark container. So user basically sets a spark.executor.memory, that's the executor memory. And that memory internally has four memory regions. Uh, there's an execution memory, a storage memory, a user memory, and a reserved memory. Uh, the storage memory and execution memory together form the unified memory. And uh, what you need to uh, note here is that uh, there are certain parameters you can use to allocate uh, how much memory you want to each of these memory regions. So for example, there's a spark.memory.fraction that tells what portion of the total memory should be given to the unified memory. And then there's a spark.memory.storage fraction that tells what portion of the unified memory uh, should be given to the storage memory. So there are certain parameters using which you can configure how much memory needs to be uh, given to each of these uh, memory. 
So we are now looking for Spark 2.x. We have moved on from 1.x at LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, initially when we added Spark, so all of these heuristics or rules that I'm talking about, uh, they apply more for Spark 2.x. Okay. Okay, so it's not fixed allocation, it is flexible, but the default values when you launch the container, it starts with these values. And then when it runs, it can, uh, like, uh, it, it starts with the 50 50 percentage for both execution and storage, and then it can expand. Yes. So now let's talk about the heuristics. So, JVM use memory is one of the heuristics that essentially identifies over allocation of resources in Spark. Uh, so, for example, there's a uh, Spark.executor memory, which tells you how many uh, GBs of containers are allocated. So in this example report, you see that there were 10 GB uh, containers or executors allocated. And if you now look into the JVM use memory among all these containers and the peak JVM use memory and pick the maximum, uh, and that is found to be the max peak JVM use memory is just 3.48 GB. So the executors, there were 10 GB containers, executors uh, blocked on the cluster, but the clusters were just, uh, the jobs were just utilizing at the max for 3.48 GB. And so the rest just contributes to wastage. So Dr. Elfin just flags those jobs, gives a recommendation, which is obvious, you reduce the executor memory. So in this case, you would set it to somewhere around 4 GB or 5 GB. The next one uh, is the unified memory heuristic. This is similar to the previous heuristic, but this looks into the overall allocation of resources in the unified memory region I talked about. So in this example, you see that the Spark memory fraction is 0.6. So based on that and the executor memory, it starts with a, a default uh, uh, allocation for the unified memory region. So there's 4.8 GB of unified memory allocated. And then among all the uh, unified memory regions, you see the uh, actual usage of the job. And that is found to be just 1 GB. So here again, you are uh, allocating too much memory into your unified memory region, but not utilizing it to the full capacity. Uh, here, so what we can do is you try to uh, deallocate memory from the uh, unified memory region and give it to the user memory region, or if the overall memory itself is low, then you reduce the, the JVM use memory is less, then you can reduce the uh, Spark executor memory. So the next one is the Spark stage heuristic. This heuristic essentially flags jobs based on the failure rate. So a Spark application can succeed in spite of several stages failing, or a stage can succeed in spite of several tasks failing. So if there is a high percentage of tasks that fail, then Dr. Elephant will flag those jobs. Uh, it will tell you how many tasks failed due to an out of memory, how many tasks failed due to overhead memory, and so on. The next one is a Spark configuration heuristic. This looks into the configuration values that the users have set and does some validation and checks on them. For example, in this report, you see that uh, there's a Spark jars parameter. That's basically when you run a Spark submit, you give a jars parameter and the list of jars that you want to load to the distributed cache. And the user sets it to lib slash star and we basically uh, discourage users from doing that. We do not want users to uh, load all the jars into the cache, but explicitly specify what jars they want because in most cases, these jars are actually not required for the job to run. So similarly, it does some more configuration checks like making sure that users do not request a very high container size for executors or the drivers. Some more rules that we're working on is to detect skewness in these memory regions, to detect the execution and storage spills, uh, GC time uh, of those containers. And next, can we write our own rules? You can now write your own rules in Dr. Elephant. Uh, you can plug it into Dr. Elephant, enable them, and Dr. Elephant will analyze all those jobs using those new, new rules that you have written. And uh, you can easily integrate with other schedulers. We already have support for Azkaban, Uzi, Airflow, Pinball, and more. Uh, you can write your own fetcher that fetches from a different data source that if you want. Uh, you can easily extend it to other job types if you wish to do. Maybe newer job types in the future, you can easily plug it into Dr. Elephant. So we open source Dr. Elephant in mid of last year. Uh, you can find the code on GitHub. Uh, there's a mailing list and uh, we also arrange hangout meetings if you have something concrete to be discussed.
So this is what uh, we plan to do next. Uh, we, the first one is the specific suggestions. So one of the things that Dr. Elephant doesn't do right now is it gives you static advice uh, on the jobs and we want to give dynamic advice. We, it, for example, it now tells you that you need to reduce the executor memory, but we want to tell by how much or by what's the exact value or the range of values that the users need to set to address those values. Uh, the next one is Spark debugging. So users at LinkedIn find it hard to debug their Spark applications. Uh, for example, whenever their Spark application fails, uh, they do not know why it failed. They do not know where to look for the logs, uh, which tasks failed and where the exact stack trace is. So we want to improve that overall experience of that. And uh, of course we are working on more Spark heuristics and we are very close to submitting it to the Apache incubation. Here are a couple of reference links. Uh, do check out the LinkedIn's engineering blog. Uh, there's open source link. Uh, there's a mailing list. Uh, the links to the Hangout meetings and other talks on YouTube. Yeah, thank you. Questions? Uh, no, we currently don't look into that. We just right, right now at this stage, we look into the configurations that the users have set. And based on these parameters, we decide these rules and heuristics. Uh, we don't go into the partitions, uh, how much memory has been allocated there. I'm sorry? Yes, we, we are having some of the uh, uh, heuristics right now, which try to detect skewness in these memory regions. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, if you if you're not aware, it's already there for MapReduce. I didn't talk about MapReduce here. There are a bunch of heuristics for MapReduce, and uh, for MapReduce we do have the heuristics right now that detects QNS. And for Spark right now uh, we have we have it's in it's in a PR stage and we'll be merging it. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so, 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 so the resource manager decides the containers, right? So you don't, you don't have control over which, uh, nodes get allocated, uh, the containers get allocated to which node? Yes. Yeah. Right. Just using uh, 4 GB, but in the next set of uh, RAM flow, it mm -hmm. may need 8 GB because the data in how much it is processing may be increased. So are you suggesting right. for most of the jobs which are more linearly scaling, it kind of works. So good or a yeah, uh, Dr. Lipin, uh, has the historical executions, but it just analyzes that specific job. It doesn't look into the historical executions. So it marks those heuristics based on that specific job. And uh, uh, it might not apply if your data changes. Uh, it runs on all of our clusters. Yes. Every job is analyzed for that specific instance. Uh, so what happens is, uh, uh, in our scenario, where the data rarely changes. So it just, it, in most cases, the data just linearly uh, changes, and the structure of the data remains same. Uh, but that's a good point. Like, uh, if that. Yeah. Yes, so it, it has the data for all the executions, so it could likely predict what the next uh, settings could be. And that's that's one of the areas, the specific suggestions that I mentioned that will tell you, uh, it can predict and tell you what's the next value that you need to set. 
but right now it just tells you how much you need to reduce it right it, it does not tell you that you set it to 4 gb or 5 gb uh, that might not apply uh, to all the things uh, the other thing is we could give a set, set some threshold values and then give some buffer space and then allocate the containers uh, based on how much it varies Static or dynamic allocation of Spark's uh, scheduling. So, depending on the SLA requirement of the job, uh, some jobs tend to get, uh, uh, you know, orchestrated on the static allocation, some on the dynamic allocation. So, just looking at this metric, is there any specific rules that this? So, uh, these rules app right now they are not specific to any uh, this thing. They are, they are you they work for dynamic allocation as well. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, so it's there's there's nothing. It's uh, it's irrespective of any allocation which is uh, triggered. It will just uh, provide those recommendations. Yes. And does it also look at the one of the other metrics which uh, highlights the scheduler delays because of the partitioning which is configured? So which which is one of the metrics which shows on the... So you mean the uh, the scheduling delay from the resource manager side? Uh, yes, yeah, Spark History Server defines if you have a CVS queueness in the data, mm -hmm. so you will, the few partitions are getting large amount of data and a lot others mostly, you know, where a lot of shuffle happens in the data, a lot of other yeah. partitions are sitting idle yeah. because of the... So I, I discussed only a few of the heuristics here. Uh, there are more Spark heuristics. Uh, they try and detect all of these, uh, but uh, uh, I, we can disc sync up offline to know exactly what uh, the scenario is. Okay, and just one last question. From the architecture point of view, is it a monolithic application which runs on an edge node, collects all the data, or it, does it run on the multiple nodes? And So the, we, we set it up one on a cluster, so uh, it runs on one, this one, on one of the nodes on the cluster and then collects all of the data for that okay. cluster. Okay, so just the one instance? One instance, yeah. Okay, thank you. Dynamic memory management, it improved the performance. Uh, so, like I said, we, we had issues with the Spark History Server to get all of the metrics earlier. And we recently fixed that problem with the Spark History Server. And we haven't done a lot of analysis around that area where when we changed what's the performance. Uh, no, my question was more about the Spark's dynamic execution management, yes. memory management, where yeah. it is spawning off more containers as your uh, tasks are waiting in the queue, right? Mm -hmm. So did you see that the overall JVM management, et cetera, is improving with that? Uh, so... No. Can you, can you uh, again come with that question? So, so the, the, uh, we there is an option for when you launch the Spark job, right? The number of executors, mem memory for executor, et cetera, is uh, static. Right. Another way is to do it in a dynamic way, right? right? As your task keep on waiting beyond a certain threshold of time, you launch more containers, et right. cetera. With that, it is expected that the overall cluster is used in a better way. Right. than using static values. So did you try doing that? And some of these issues that you see, uh, which yeah. were identified earlier by Dr. Elephant, got resolved with uh, dynamic management. Right. So uh, I don't think we have any heuristics around that area yet. Okay. Uh, so those were the configurations that it was checking. And it was just letting the, uh, knowing what are the important configurations that the users have set. And then it does some validations around that. Uh, it wasn't checking if it was uh, dynamic allocation and because of that, what should be the setting. There was no checks around that. When you were saying that, uh, so suggesting that, you know, uh, reduce your execution memory. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what parameters you go after? I mean, how, how do you say that, you know, you need to reduce it? So, uh, in that specific example that I talked about, you saw that it was over, there was over, over allocation of resources, right? So uh, it's it's a trivial scenario where you would want to reduce the executor memory there. But uh, it, it also depends, right? So for an example, um, my batch is working on weekends where I get less data, right? And if I, maybe you know, on Monday or Tuesday, probably I'll get more data. Yeah. So in that case, if I run Dr. Elephant in both the days, I'll get a different results. Yes. Right? You so would. Monday probably they will not complain, but yes. Saturday they will. Yes, you would.
I'm sorry, can you take the mic? Streaming jobs, uh, have you used it in? Uh... So we haven't been into that area yet. We are not looking into streaming jobs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it depends upon, uh, as he told, the timings and application at which uh, sometimes the streaming data will be more and sometimes it will be less based on the peak hours. Yeah. So it, it, it looks into the peak memory. So uh, I haven't looked into that area yet, but it should. It looks into the peak memory in each of these executors. And then based on that, it tell, recommends what the memory should be. Yes, this, this the report comes after the job completes. So, uh, uh, yeah, he, he had a question before, yeah. No, no, uh, anyone can access right now. It's, it's uh, yeah. So, uh, just here and then I'll come back, yeah. Do you also uh, try to figure out what is the uh, uh, appropriate block size at which, you know, the partitioning and everything should happen? No, uh, like I said, we don't look into the disk side yet. Uh, we there's a the block size is there, but we do not look into the partitions of the each job, what partitions, how many partitions it has, or any heuristics around that. No, it's uh, not like uh, I I got the answer, but uh, just yeah. to portray exactly my where question is. So the point is that uh, looking at the statistics, right? These are the partitions. What are the size of that? Uh, but accordingly, we have also have the data related to uh, how much time that particular mapper take or a particular stage or a task uh, took around to actually get that uh, processed. So can we also come up with some kind of uh, optimal block size? Probably you should have so that all of your JVM's processes, they are uh, running everything uh, in proportion. Nothing like data is very skewed. So, so you mean the HDFS block size? Yes. Okay, but that is... Okay, in our scenario, it's like a single cluster. So we have one fixed block size for the entire cluster. Uh, so we, uh, we could come up with a better HDFS block size for the entire cluster, uh, but it's not a user setting. Uh, you can override, override that in the Spark, right? Something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure of that. Okay. Sorry? Is it container right? Uh, can you take the mic? Is it dockerized? No, it is not dockerized right now. So, so if I see, you know, the, the way it works is like, you know, I have a job, you know, probably and I need this unit further. So I can quickly... Uh, can you hold the mic closer? Yeah. So I have a job, you know, I might need to tune it further. So I, it should be like, you know, I just want to quickly bring it up and to look at the uh, stats and then, you know, tune and then once I'm done, you know, I, I should be able to wipe out that kind of support? Uh, no, it is, you, you cannot spawn it that way right now. You set it up once on a cluster and then- Always running type. Yeah, it would be good to have that, like you give an application and then get the report for it, right? Uh, like you, you would want to analyze on the go, like you say give an application, then ask Dr. Elephant to analyze it and it analyzes and gets the report. Uh, it's not at that stage. It does it in the background, you launch it, does it in the background, analyzes the report and keep it. And then you can look at it later. Okay, so what are the known limitations as of now? Uh, so the Spark history server to make it run with Spark was, it's, a, it's not straightforward. I mean, uh, you would need to take those patches from Spark. Uh, the, for the stability of the Spark history server, you need to, uh, the ticket that I mentioned has some of the improvements on the caching side. So you need to backport those patches and deploy the version of history server. Uh, so that Dr. Elephant can talk smoothly to the history server. Uh, that's the like the major bottleneck there. But going forward, uh, once there's an official release of that, it should be much easier to set it up. Uh, so those were the major challenges we faced while integrating it with Spark. And uh, yeah, apart from that, we, we are always looking for more ideas on rules. What can we add? So that's why we have made it pluggable so that uh, people from the community who have experienced tuning Spark jobs can just, if they know of certain patterns, they can write it, write it in terms of rules. More the rules, the better the uh, it gets, right? So. Okay. You are uh, using MD, right? So are there any rules uh, pertaining to the CPU or the cores allocated 
does it check the utilization of the cpus uh i don't think there are but there is a i'm not sure if it is on maplitude side there is a heuristic that tells the skewness in the time uh how long each task takes and then tells the skewness in the tasks i'm not sure if it is for mapreduce or spark uh yeah but yeah mostly it is right now for memory yes you can add the rules at any time one more thing uh, did you test it's, it's, the... it's we, uh, like we we are finding it hard to find rules so if there are ideas then we welcome the contributions from open source on that area one Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yes, to answer your question, no, uh, it doesn't look into the code. It just looks yeah. into the configurations right now. If I run the job, a job in um, uh, the logs are in debug mode. Um, mm -hmm. Will it be able to collect those? Uh, in the size of the log will become huge, right? So yes. in that case, so also it is analyzed. So uh, I told you there were two fetchers we experimented with. One was the REST fetcher. The REST fetcher had problems talking to the history server. But uh, the other one was the FS fetcher to read from logs. So I said there's a cap on how much, uh, there's a cap on the log size it can analyze. So it won't analyze jobs which have large log files. If you use the, F, uh, the HDFS replay parser, uh, but uh, the, if you use the REST fetcher, then with the new Spark history server that I mentioned, along with those backported patches, then it will work with the REST fetcher. So in that case, you don't need to worry about the size of the log. is still monolithic so uh, i'm aware of a couple of other applications which does pretty much the same thing so one is enterprise tool called paper data and then there is an yes. hdp provided uh, software called smart sense okay. so both to, bo both of them the relies not because history server is a bottleneck anyway because uh, it's not just for this specific application it needs to serve the all other users as mm. well uh, so the HDFS, all of this uh, metrics which are exposed by history server are already present in the HDFS and all of this application actually spawns a smaller jobs which does the batch analysis on those metrics which are present in the HDFS yeah. and then collect those, denormalize those and put it into some yeah. DB which then uh, they can be queried. Yeah. So are there you know the the problem going going down that route is that uh, you know uh, you need to replay the logs in doctor elephant while that is already been done in the history server uh, you don't need to do it again here and you don't need to take over all the code from history server the replaying uh, listeners and put it here and there was other problem that you can't get all the metrics using this parser because there's a lot of logic in the spark code that is not exposed so either we need to copy over the code which we didn't want to go down that route and because the Spark History Server all, has all the metrics, we can directly take rest and get all of the metrics, right? Yeah. So as in interest of time, right, uh, we can take one last question from the audience, and then we can uh, go to the next question. Uh, so for an example uh, application, uh, when it runs, so there's certain areas you probably would like to uh, cache uh, a persistent memory. So, so do you have any any recommendation on those side? I mean, this Dr. Elephant provides no. No, right now it is very basic. Uh, okay. It just looks into the configurations, and uh, we just started or we okay. set up the fetcher. Right now, we just got the metrics. Okay. And we just experimented with few of the rules right now. Uh, and uh, so awesome. we okay. are yet to add more rules. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Akshay. So, uh, if you have any more questions, you can take offline with Akshay. Uh, so, right now we are taking 30 minutes break, and in that you can use washroom. Washroom in this area, you can find the board and you can utilize that. And the snacks and tea, coffee, you can you can see that side, right? You can use that, and we'll we'll come here at sharp 11:30 so that we can start our own next talk, right? Okay. Thank you.